Abby was found floating face down at the shallow end of the pool, while Austin kicked and splashed in distress, seemingly <laughs> slipping in and out of consciousness. They were rushed to the hospital. Meanwhile, their mother and stepfather had no idea the siblings were in danger. They reached the hotel lobby and waited for Abby and Austin to join them for dinner. But as time passed, they grew worried. Where were they? Finally, Ginny and John asked hotel staff to call the siblings' room. What happened next changed the course of their lives forever. A hotel employee told them to wait. The woman went to get the general manager of the resort, who informed them about the accident. When Ginny and John arrived at the hospital, they found out the siblings' blood alcohol level was very high at the time of the incident. Three times the limb home state of Wisconsin had suffered a concussion and had a golf ball sized lump on his head, but he was awake. The same couldn't be said about Abby. She had a broken collarbone and remained unconscious after prolonged oxygen deprivation. Ginny and John were desperate to help their daughter, but when doctors told them she had to be transferred to an intensive care unit in Cancun and demanded a $6,371 payment. Cyber threats are everywhere. How do you keep your employees protected? Introducing Fished, a security awareness training platform that helps building your human firewall. Activate your settings, set the recurrence, and launch your company-wide plus a $10,000 deposit for the Cancun hospital before they transfer her. The parents found themselves in a desperate situation. They had to find another solution. The following day, Abby was eventually airlifted to a trauma center in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, but doctors declared her brain dead on arrival. Since Abby had always expressed a strong desire to be an organ donor, her body was kept on life support until suitable recipients were found. In the days after the tragedy, Abby's family attempted to file a police report into the incident, but their attempts were futile. Mexican police insisted the cause of death was accidental drowning, but the family had a hard time believing this. After he recovered, Austin said he suspected they'd been drugged. But according to a multi-part investigation led by Milwaukee's The Journal Sentinel, something even more foul could be at play in Abby's death. Several people came forward and spoke to the Sentinel about their own experiences of blacking out after drinking small and moderate amounts of alcohol at resorts in Playa del Carmen and Cancun. The report chronicled harrowing accounts of American tourists who were robbed or assaulted after being incapacitated by what appeared to be tainted or poisoned alcohol. Some victims also reported being extorted for medical services. The investigation uncovered widespread claims that tourists who attempted to warn others about terrifying experiences had their reviews removed from the hotel review site, TripAdvisor. Later in 2017, Mexican authorities raided 31 resorts and seized 10,000 gallons of illicit alcohol from an illegal distillery in Playa del Carmen. In November, Abby's family filed a lawsuit accusing Iberostar Resort of negligence. According to the lawsuit, Iberostar knew that alcoholic beverages being served at the Hotel Iberostar Paraíso del Mar were tainted, substandard, poisonous, unfit for human consumption and or otherwise failed to meet bare minimum standards for food and beverage safety. It was May 24, 2022 in Colima, Mexico. Ben Corser, a 37-year-old software engineer from Cornwall, England, had been living in Mexico since January. Ben was known for his pleasant nature and had become part of the local community in Colima. He was living with a Mexican-American family, including his friends Claudio and Alfredo, both skateboarders whom he joined in their activities. Ben's days were filled with joy and exploration, but on this day, his life took a tragic turn. On the evening of May 24th, Ben and Claudio returned from a trip to Guadalajara. Alfredo picked them up in a car to run some errands. They drove along the main boulevard in Colima and stopped at a supermarket on Camino Real Boulevard to buy some groceries. Ben was sitting in the back seat Claudio in the front passenger seat and Alfredo behind the wheel. It was supposed to be a routine stop, but it turned into a nightmare. As they sat in the car outside the supermarket, gunfire erupted. All three men were shot dead in an instant. The sudden brutal attack left no room for escape or understanding. There were no signs of robbery, kidnapping, or any other clear motive. It was an unprovoked attack that left the community in shock and Ben's family devastated. Ben's parents, Andrew Corser, a former head teacher, and Lorraine Downs, along with his brother Tom, received the heartbreaking news back in Cornwall. 
They described the situation as Ben being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The lack of explanation or reason behind the killings compounded their grief. The police investigation was ongoing, but the family had received no answers. In the weeks leading up to the attack, there had been a dramatic upsurge in violence in Colima. Nearly 400 people had been killed in the crime wave that had swept through the region since January 25th. However, this violence had not been directed at tourists, making the attack on Ben and his friends all the more senseless. Local reporter Bertha Reynoso noted that Ben was the first foreign national to be killed in this wave of violence. The news of Ben's death spread quickly, and tributes poured in from around the world. Friends and family remembered him as a vibrant, multi-talented individual who lived life to the fullest. Ben held first-class degrees in both fine arts and mathematics. He was an artist, poet, computer programmer, skateboarder, sea swimmer, wild camper, festival goer, actor, yoga lover, photographer, music maker, and dancer. He had a rare breadth of interests and was known for his generosity and joy for life. Ben's family issued a statement expressing their profound grief and loss. They thanked the community of St. Just, Ben's large network of friends, and everyone who had offered support during this difficult time. The family also arranged for Ben's body to be returned to the UK for a funeral in St. Just, scheduled for midsummer, June 24th. State Prosecutor's Office spokesperson Gustavo Adrian Joya Cervera stated that the office was in contact with the British government to clarify the issue and assist with the repatriation of Ben's body. The British Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office also confirmed that it was providing support to Ben's family and was in contact with local authorities. Despite the ongoing police investigation, no clear motive for the killings had been established. The attack seemed to be a tragic case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The randomness of the violence left Ben's family and friends struggling to comprehend the senselessness of the act. On February 9, 2024, 44-year-old Nico Honabach was enjoying a getaway at the Mia Beach Club in Tulum, Mexico, a popular destination for tourists. Nico had spent a great day in the company of her two beloved dogs, Skylar and Coco, and was just about to leave when tragedy ensued, leaving behind a world of hurt for Carl Perman, Nico's husband of 15 years. It's been a long road since I started in the writer's room. It took me a while to realize that simplifying your approach can... Nico was a Los Angeles native with a significant following on Instagram, where she documented her glamorous life and travels. She was a cheerful person who loved to travel. As such, she split her time between Beverly Hills, California, and Cancun, Mexico. Nico had been feeling increasingly unsafe in Los Angeles due to rising crime and homelessness. She had recently survived a harrowing experience. Once, while out on a walk with her two dogs, Nico was chased by a person with a knife. This prompted her to decide to spend more time in Cancun. Her husband, Carl Perman, a former DEA agent with extensive law enforcement experience, agreed with Nico. On that fateful day, Nico had just finished eating and was preparing to pay her bill at the Mia Beach Club restaurant when the unimaginable happened. It was about 6.40 p.m. that Sunday when a man ran into the restaurant, chased by another armed man. The first man was Sean Billery, a 22-year-old Belizean with known cartel affiliations. The second man was another drug dealer. As Billery attempted to flee, his pursuers opened fire. Tourists initially mistook the gunfire for fireworks, but then the gunman shot Billery once in the back. Unable to run anymore, Billery was overtaken by the gunman, who then opened fire several more times. It was then that one of the stray bullets struck and killed Nico. According to several witnesses, staff didn't react. They didn't check on Nico. It was other guests that rushed to her aid, but it was too late. Carl, Nico's husband, was out of town at the time of the incident. He was traveling for work when he received a devastating call from a friend informing him about the shooting. Perman, utilizing his extensive background in law enforcement, immediately took steps to confirm his wife's identity and address the situation with local authorities. However, according to Carl himself, he encountered significant obstacles. Once he arrived in Tulum, Perman faced uncooperative and initially dismissive local authorities. He was desperate. His grief was immense. Still, Carl had to spend hours at the homicide investigations office demanding to see Nico's body to confirm her identity. To top things off, 
and to add insult to injury. Local media reports falsely suggested Nico's involvement in drug-related activities. Carl had to provide substantial evidence, including Nico's passport and marriage certificate, to refute these claims and defend her reputation. Mexican authorities eventually issued an apology. There are no public updates on the investigation. The personal circumstances of Nico's untimely death added to the tragedy. She had fled Los Angeles fearing for her safety, but despite her fears, Nico's tragic fate unfolded far from her troubled hometown, in a place where she had sought refuge. On August 9, 2020, Lisbeth Flores left her home in Brownsville, Texas on foot and walked across the Veterans International Bridge, thus crossing the U.S.-Mexico border to the city of Matamoros, Mexico. The 23-year-old, who was a mother of two, called her mother, Maria Rubio, and told her she was visiting her boyfriend in Matamoros and that she would be returning home to Brownsville that night. But the cause of Lisbeth's going to Matamoros was far different. Earlier that Sunday, the young woman had received a message from an acquaintance of hers, a man called Braulio Martinez. According to the message, Lisbeth's boyfriend, who was also the father of her two young children, had been kidnapped, and the kidnappers were asking for ransom. The young woman, maybe gripped by terror or overcome by love, decided to leave the safety of her home and save her husband without alerting the authorities or letting her family know about the truth as she knew it. This proved to be a fatal mistake. Less than 24 hours after Lisbeth called her mother, Maria Rubio, the older woman called the Brownsville Police Department. It was August 10th, and Lisbeth failed to return home the way she'd promised over the phone. Lisbeth was reported missing, and police started looking for her. In the meantime, Lisbeth's sister, Carmen, received a text from Braulio Martinez. The man told her he couldn't find Lisbeth anywhere in Matamoros. At no point, though, did he mention he had told Lisbeth about her boyfriend being kidnapped. Lisbeth's family feared the worst. What if something horrible happened to her? She was so young, and her children were so little. Her baby boy was only eight months old. Her daughter was four years old. They could only wait and hope that the police would find the young woman. Police did find Lisbeth Flores only one day after she was reported missing. They found her in a grassy field near a construction site in Matamoros, Mexico. She was shirtless, lying face up in the field. She had a horrible injury to her face. A part of her scalp was missing. And to make things even more horrifying, all of Elizabeth's teeth had been pulled out of her mouth. The young woman was dead, and everything pointed to a very violent death. Investigators agreed the woman had been tortured, suffering at the hands of a very deranged individual. Elizabeth died from a blunt force trauma to her head. A rock covered in blood was discovered near her body, but the culprit had left enough evidence behind. Braulio Martinez was arrested at his home on August 18th, a little over a week after authorities discovered Elizabeth's body. The Tamaulipas State Prosecutor's Office charged the man with the murder of Lisbeth Flores. According to an anonymous law enforcement official, Braulio Martinez fabricated the story of the kidnapping in order to lure Lisbeth across the border with the motive for the brutal crime being a robbery. It is unclear how Lisbeth knew Braulio Martinez. What we do know, however, is that Martinez is a convicted sex offender. He spent four years in a state prison in Huntsville after pleading guilty to two counts of sexual assault on a child. He was released in 2010. Lisbeth's family had to set up a GoFundMe page in order to raise money for the young woman's funeral. The Mexican government offered the family assistance in returning Lisbeth, but a local funeral parlor eventually stepped in to help the grieving family. It was November 1st, 2021 in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Joe Dobson, a 19-year-old British teenager, was spending time with his friends in this seaside resort town in the Quintana Roo region. He had been enjoying his stay in Mexico, exploring the local beaches, shops, and restaurants. However, this day would take a tragic turn that none of his friends could have anticipated. Joe had severe allergies to sesame, eggs, milk, and peanuts. He always carried his EpiPen with him, a vital tool in case of an allergic reaction. His friends, Harriet Preston and Ryan, were fully aware of his medical condition and the seriousness of his allergies. The group had spent the day relaxing on the beach and wandering through the local shops. By the evening, they were ready to have dinner at a fusion restaurant they had visited before, confident in the safety of the food there. Joe was particularly careful when it came to ordering food. He had learned enough Spanish to communicate his dietary restrictions clearly. 
That evening, he ordered a vegetarian burrito and stressed multiple times, both in English and Spanish, that his meal must not contain sesame. The waiter acknowledged his request and Joe felt reassured that he had done everything possible to ensure his safety. When the food arrived, Joe immediately sensed something was wrong. He inspected his burrito using the flashlight on his phone and felt uneasy about its appearance. Trusting his instincts, he sent the burrito back, insisting again that it should not contain sesame. The waiter took the plate back to the kitchen and returned with a new burrito. Joe examined it again and took a bite, followed by two more. Within moments, he knew something was terrible. At Vistaprint, we print signs so people can see your brand up close. But we also print signs so that people can see your business here. See it here. And see it here. So you probably wrong. His throat began to itch and swell, a clear sign that his burrito still contained sesame. Panicking, Joe rushed to the bar staff, explaining in broken English that he needed an ambulance. However, the staff seemed indifferent to his pleas. They suggested he drink a concoction of honey and lemon a remedy that would do nothing to alleviate his severe allergic reaction. Joe, desperate and struggling to breathe, complied just to keep them quiet. Realizing that he had left his EpiPen at their Airbnb, Joe and his friends decided to rush back to retrieve it. They hailed a taxi, but the driver moved casually, not understanding the urgency of the situation. Every second counted, and this delay was critical. Joe's breathing became more labored, and his friends could see the fear in his eyes. By the time they reached the apartment complex, Joe was barely able to stand. He collapsed near the elevator, gasping for air. Ryan sprinted upstairs to grab the EpiPen while Harriet tried to comfort Joe, who was now crawling into the elevator. When Ryan returned, they administered the EpiPen, but it was too late. Joe's body had already gone into anaphylactic shock and the injection was not enough to reverse the severe reaction. They called for help and a police car eventually took Joe to the local hospital. The doctors did everything they could, but Joe's condition was too critical. He lost consciousness and died that evening. The inquest into Joe's death revealed a series of tragic missteps. Coroner Mark Taylor summarized the events, highlighting that Joe had done everything in his power to prevent the incident. He had communicated his allergies clearly and repeatedly, both in Spanish and English. The restaurant staff, however, had failed to understand the gravity of his situation. Their negligence and lack of basic first aid knowledge contributed significantly to the tragedy. Joe's friends, Harriet and Ryan, provided detailed accounts of the evening. Harriet recalled how Joe had always celebrated her achievements, no matter how small and how careful he was with his allergies. She described the chilling moment when Joe realized his burrito contained sesame and his desperate attempts to get help from the restaurant staff. Ryan confirmed her story, adding that the staff's casual attitude and the taxi driver's slow response only worsened the situation. Coroner Taylor noted that there was a crucial 10 to 15 minute gap between the onset of Joe's reaction and the administration of the EpiPen. While it's unclear if the outcome would have been different with immediate medical attention, the delay certainly did not help. The coroner's report emphasized that Joe had acted unwittingly in consuming the food containing sesame, and the restaurant's failure to heed his warnings was a significant factor in his death. On August 11th, 2023, five childhood friends were returning home after attending a festival. But Roberto Olmeda, Diego Lara, Uriel Galvin, Dante Cedillo, and Jaime Martinez never made it home. Their families desperately looked for answers. But when a terrifying video showing the five young men bound and gagged was uploaded to social media, it became obvious that something horrifying happened to them, most likely at the hands of one of Mexico's most ruthless cartels. Roberta Olmeda, 20, Diego Lara, 20, Uriel Galvin, 19, Dante Cedillo, 22, and Jaime Martinez, 21, were friends and college students from Lagos de Moreno. The five young men would often spend time together. It was obvious that their bond was strong. Roberto was studying engineering at the university. Diego was a blacksmith working in his father's shop. Uriel was a passionate cyclist and the youngest of the group. Dante was a professional cyclist who had recently started a business, and Jaime worked as a bricklayer. Each had a promising future ahead, with aspirations to succeed in their respective fields. On August 11th, they attended a festival, unaware that this would mark their last. So what's the smartest decision you'll make today? It's called Pitmanship, multi-carrier software that saves you time and money 
Use our rate shopping recommendation tool to find the best carrier for your shipment. Print first-class postage for letters and shipping labels for all major carriers from your computer or phone. And you enjoy healthy discount last happy moments together. After attending the annual festival celebrating a town's patron saint, the friends decided to head home. One of them texted a family member at around 10.55 p.m., letting them know he was coming home. But then, something happened. They were driving through San Miguel when witnesses reported they were intercepted by ten armed men. The gunmen forcibly removed them from their vehicle and transported them in a white pickup truck and a van with blacked-out windows. This marked the beginning of their horrifying ordeal. Once kidnapped, the five friends were taken to a remote location. There, they were subjected to unimaginable torture. First, the gunmen tied their hands behind their backs and bound their mouths with duct tape. The gunmen then proceeded to record the whole ordeal. One of the young men was forced to beat, stab and decapitate his friend under the threat of his own death. The friends were tortured and killed. Soon after, they were reported missing. In the meantime, the horrifying video of their last moments was released on social media. The Mexican authorities launched a thorough investigation into the case. The Attorney General's office in Jalisco, along with federal prosecutors, led the inquiry, given the involvement of organized crime. The video shocked the nation, and even more drew international attention to the escalating violence in Jalisco. Authorities later discovered four burned human skulls and significant bloodstains at a property in the Orilla del Agua neighborhood, suggesting the site of the brutal killings. Additionally, a burnt-out Volkswagen Jetta containing human remains was found, believed to belong to Diego Lara. According to official reports, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel, CJNG, known for its brutal enforcement methods, was responsible for the abduction. The cartel had reportedly lured the men under the guise of a job offer, a tactic used to recruit new members into their ranks. The five friends were allegedly offered positions as security guards through a call center linked to the cartel, which posted fake job offers to trap unsuspecting victims. Once brought to the property in the Orilla del Agua neighborhood, the five friends were faced with a choice, become members of the cartel or be killed. When they refused to pledge allegiance to the cartel, the friends were tortured and killed. Governor Enrique Alfaro condemned the heinous act, which he described as a senseless and direct attack against the stability of Mexico. He emphasized the need for a strong governmental response to combat the cartel's influence and protect the citizens of Jalisco. Several experts have highlighted the cartel's strategy of forced recruitment through call centers, particularly targeting young individuals from neighboring states. According to these experts, CJNG has established numerous training and recruitment centers in the region, coercing new recruits into committing violent acts to prove their loyalty. On June 11, 2024, Jorge Guillen of El Paso, Texas, was on vacation with his wife, Lizette Zambrano, and other family members. The group was staying at the Sonoran Sea Resort in Puerto Penasco, Mexico, which is located on the strip of land that joins the Baja California Peninsula with the rest of Mexico. At 43 years old, Jorge was an evening student at Western Technical College, studying refrigeration or HVAC. He was only days from graduation, which he was set to attend on Friday, June 14th, but he never made it. What was supposed to be a relaxing vacation with friends and family suddenly turned into a horrifying tragedy. That Tuesday evening on June 11th, Horge and his wife, 35-year-old Lizette, were spending some time at the resort pool with Lizette's cousin and her boyfriend. They were in the pool for about 20 minutes, but it was getting dark and Jorge wanted to visit the beach too. Jorge and Lizette left the pool and went to the beach. The couple sat and talked on the beach, relishing the view. It was getting darker still. After a while, they decided to return to the resort, back to their friends and family. Upon returning, Jorge and Lizette found their son and her cousin in the resort's hot tub. Deciding to join them, the couple got into the hot tub for a little bit. The bubbles had just turned on. After a while, though, their son and cousin got out of the tub. Borge and Lisette decided to stay and relax for a while longer. They were completely unaware that danger was lurking. Eventually, Lisette got out of the water and sat on the pool deck. Everything was peaceful, at least for the moment. Ten minutes later, Jorge looked at his wife, letting out an expletive both in wonder and terror. Lisette didn't have to wonder at the reason. 
she could feel the electric shock too. In an instant, 43-year-old Horge Guillaume keeled over. Despite feeling the continuous stream of electric shocks herself, Lizette sprang forward. She had to help her husband. She had to get him out of the water. But Lizette barely managed to touch her husband's body before the electric shock incapacitated her too. Lizette realized she wasn't able to move anymore. Then she started praying that God would help them both. Then there was only darkness. In the meantime, as Lizette slipped into unconsciousness, the couple's friends and family, as well as other resort guests, noticed something was wrong. They watched in horror as Jorge Guillon sank to the bottom of the hot tub, unmoving. By then, Lizette was unconscious too. People rushed to help the couple. Some started praying while others sprang into action. But each attempt to get them out of the hot tub was rendered useless. The would-be rescuers were also getting shocked. Lizette's uncle managed to get the woman out of the water. She had no pulse. Someone started CPR. In the meantime, people struggled to save Jorge, but the shocks were incredibly strong, and he was at the bottom of the hot tub, making his rescue incredibly difficult. To top things off, it took resort staff some 10 minutes to hit the jacuzzi's emergency shutoff switch. Several relatives wrapped a metal pole in towels and managed to push Jorge toward the edge of the tub. Eventually, they managed to pull Jorge out of the water. He wasn't breathing. Lizette was revived after being shocked. She had suffered burns consistent with electrocution and was in critical condition. She was transported to a hospital in Arizona. Several hours later, as she regained her consciousness, Lizette was able to overhear some nurses talking. When one of them said, her husband didn't make it, Lizette knew the absolute worst had happened to her and her family. After recovering from her injuries, Lizette Zambrano decided to file a lawsuit in El Paso County District Court against Casago LLC, the facilitator of the vacation rental. According to Lizette, she and her husband were electrocuted by faulty wiring that sent an electrical current into the water. Lizette also alleges that a nearby security guard didn't help when he was asked to turn off the power to the hot tub. Lizette is suing the resort for $1 million. She wants someone to take responsibility for her husband's death, and she wants to prevent something like this from happening to somebody else. Makes sense. It was April 16, 2024, in Cancun, Mexico, a bustling city known for its resorts and nightlife. Early that morning at 5 a.m., the tranquility of the City Express Hotel was shattered by a gruesome discovery. A 58-year-old British tourist was found dead in his room, lying in a pool of blood. His wife, a 53-year-old British woman, was found beside him with multiple cuts on her arms. This disturbing scene marked the beginning of a complex and tragic investigation. The man was found with a broken bottle between his legs, and there was blood spread across the room, including on his arms and chest. The initial shock of the scene was compounded by the apparent lack of immediate evidence pointing to what exactly had transpired. The hotel staff quickly alerted the authorities, and detectives rushed to the scene. When emergency services arrived, they found the woman still alive. She was promptly taken to the hospital. Reports indicated that she might have been under the influence of an unknown substance, which could explain her disoriented state. Despite her injuries, the cuts on her arms were not deep, and she was later released from the hospital. Local prosecutors quickly began their investigation. Early reports speculated a crime of passion due to the violent nature of the scene. However, the prosecutors made it clear that they were exploring all possibilities. One line of investigation suggested that the incident could have been an agreement between the couple about taking their own lives together, with only the husband succeeding in ending his life. The hotel became the center of a media frenzy. Mexican local newspapers reported the case as a homicide, casting suspicion on the wife. Photographs of the scene, including the man being stretchered into an ambulance under a blue sheet, circulated widely. Despite the grim nature of the photos, they provided little additional clarity about what had happened in that room. The Attorney General's office in Quintana Roo, which oversees Cancun, made a public statement. They confirmed that an investigation was underway and that both the man and his wife were traveling on British passports. They also mentioned their cooperation with the British consulate to support the families involved. The spokesman for the Attorney General's office stated that after receiving reports of a foreign tourist death in a hotel in the municipality of Benito Juarez, an investigation was launched to clarify the circumstances. The initial lines of inquiry suggest that this tragic incident may be a possible self-murder involving two individuals who intended to end their lives. 
As the investigation continued, details about the couple's background began to emerge. They were known to have been traveling alone without any immediate family or friends. This fact complicated the investigation, as there were few first-hand accounts of their behavior. CEO means being a collaborator and a nurturer. Don't you have to be at work? <laughs> Everyone is just waiting for me to buckle under the pressure. Is now a good time to introduce the interns? Yeah. Hey, how'd you get that dog to calm down? I gave it a cookie. You always have cookies on you. Why do you want one? Behavior or state of mind leading up to the incident. The man's wife, after being released from the hospital, had not been arrested but her current whereabouts were unknown. This added another layer of mystery and urgency to the case. Authorities were keen on locating her, both for her safety and to gain further insights into what had transpired. The sources close to the investigation revealed that no arrests had been made and the case remained open. They reiterated that the initial findings were not definitive and that they were considering all possible scenarios. This included the possibility of the wife being under the influence of a substance which might have affected her actions and recollections of the events. Local Mexican newspapers continued to publish various theories, some suggesting a violent argument had led to the husband's death. However, the prosecutors distanced themselves from these speculations, focusing instead on their ongoing investigation. As days passed, the British consulate in Mexico played a significant role in supporting the investigation. They worked closely with the local authorities and assisted the couple's families back in the UK. This international cooperation was crucial in navigating the complexities of the case. Despite the ongoing investigation, many questions remained unanswered. Why would a seemingly normal tourist couple end up in such a tragic situation? What was the nature of their relationship? Were there underlying issues or conflicts that led to this incident? The lack of concrete answers left room for speculation and concern. On November 4th, 2019, several members of the Lee Baron and Langford families, American Mexican Mormons, were on their way to a wedding. It was supposed to be a day filled with joy. Instead, it became a horrific act of violence in northern Mexico, near the United States border, an act that shocked both nations. By the end of the day, nine people three women and six young children were dead due to a complicated history and the usual cartel violence plaguing the region. The LeBaron and Langford families are Mormon families who have resided in La Mora, Mexico for over a century. These families initially migrated from the United States in the early 20th century, seeking refuge after the US government outlawed polygamy, which was then part of their faith. Settling in Northern Mexico, they established communities like La Mora in Sonora and Colonia LeBaron in Chihuahua, which became home to many dual US-Mexican citizens. Time passed and religious practices changed, but the families continued to reside in the region. However, over the years, the families faced threats and violence, particularly from drug cartels. In recent years, the LeBaron family in particular has been outspoken against cartel violence, further escalating tensions with criminal groups. It certainly didn't help that the area was a battleground for control over bountiful drug smuggling routes. In November 2019, Los Salazar, an affiliate of the infamous Sinaloa cartel, and La Linea, an offshoot of the Juarez cartel, were actively fighting over the region. Unbeknownst to the LeBaron and Langford families, earlier on November 4th, the very road they were driving on had been the scene of a fierce shootout between Los Salazar and La Linea. As such, tensions were high, it was time to leave for the wedding. Ronita Miller LeBaron and her four children set out in the first vehicle, followed by two other SUVs driven by Dawna Ray Langford and Christina Marie Langford, each with their children. But as the three cars approached the municipality of Bavispe, Sonora, they were ambushed by multiple gunmen. Christina Langford realized they were in grave danger. She decided to get out of the vehicle and signal that they weren't members of the rival cartel. But before doing so, Christina took her baby daughter, Faith, and carefully placed her on the floor of her SUV to protect her. When Christina exited her car, 
She started waving her arms to signal her innocence, but the gunmen didn't care. They opened fire and killed the woman. The second white suburban was carrying Dorna Langford and nine children. Gunfire ripped into the car, killing Dorna and two of her sons, 11-year-old Trevor and 3-year-old Rogan. Ronita Miller LeBaron's car was shot up and burst into flames. Ronita was killed, and so were her four children, her six-month-old twins, Titus and Tiana, her 10-year-old daughter, Crystal, and 12-year-old son, Howard. But eight of the children, some of them merely infants, had survived. In the horrifying aftermath, Dorna's quick-thinking 13-year-old son, Devin, took charge of the situation. He covered his siblings, some of whom were injured, with branches to hide them, then he left to get help. Devin walked 13 miles back to Lamora, but as time passed, Devin's nine-year-old sister grew more concerned. The little girl decided to follow her brother. She too walked for hours to seek help. The official search for the survivors started between 6 and 7 p.m. The children who survived were found at 8.30 p.m., with the exception of the children who went on foot in search of assistance. At 9.45 p.m., the girl who went for help was also found. Relatives from Lamora tried to reach them before that, but were turned back by gunfire. Five of the children were seriously wounded, and as such, were flown to the United States to receive hospital care. The three others who were not injured were returned to their families in Lamora. The aftermath of the massacre saw a robust response from both Mexican and US authorities. Family members visited the scene under the protection of the Mexican army, and funerals were held with attendees from as far as North Dakota. The Mexican government attributed the attack to a case of mistaken identity, believing the family's vehicles were mistaken for those of a rival cartel. However, there is speculation that the family's outspoken stance against cartel violence may have played a role. However, other theories pertain to events that happened prior to the attack. As such, it was alleged that in the months leading up to the massacre, Los Salazar warned residents against buying fuel across state lines in Chihuahua and new enforcers in the area began exhibiting increasingly aggressive behavior. Even more, the Lamora community, including the LeBaron and Langford families, had reportedly reached a fragile understanding with Los Salazar, one of the warring cartels. According to some sources, La Linea may have targeted the Mormons to send a message to Los Salazar about their presence and influence in the region. Following the massacre, 31 individuals with apparent ties to La Linea You're about to see some of the scariest videos floating around the internet. Let's check them out. Our first bizarre clip of the day comes from the TikTok account Terra S Nocturnos. See if you can spot the small detail that has everyone freaking out. Did you catch it? The number on the player's back appears to change. It goes from 21 to question mark J, then to 18. This fleeting change might be easy to miss upon first viewing, but once spotted, it's hard to unsee. The bizarre transformation of the number has ignited a barrage of theories online. One of the most popular speculations is that this could be a glitch in the matrix, referring to the idea that our reality is nothing more than a computer-generated simulation. Delving deeper into this hypothesis, some enthusiasts suggest that the glitch might be hinting at a secretive code embedded within our simulated existence. However, deciphering this code or understanding its significance remains elusive. Whether you're a believer in the simulated reality theory or just enjoy a good online mystery, one thing's certain. This strange sighting is adding fuel to the fire of internet enigmas. Urbex Hill, a rising YouTube channel specialising in urban exploration, has taken its audience on another hair-raising journey, this time to the long-abandoned Paul Revere Elementary School in Cleveland, Ohio. Chris, the channel's lead investigator, ventures into the dilapidated building to uncover its secrets, and what he discovers has left viewers puzzled and somewhat unsettled. 
The Paul Revere Elementary School was constructed back in 1920 with significant extensions added between 1925 and 1926. The school closed in 2010 due to lack of funding and dwindling student numbers. It wasn't long before the property fell into disrepair, the broken windows and crumbling facade adding to the rumours that the property is haunted. Heading in on a cold winter's night, Chris begins to navigate the old school's maze of hallways and deserted classrooms. It isn't long before Chris realises he may not be the only person in the building. What is that? Do you hear that? Someone else is walking around with a flashlight. It's not, it's not hard to see why the mist seems How you doing? I'm Callan. You're about to wit Dom Bonfire Night. While preparing the fire, her dad discovered an old mouldy saddle and casually shared a photo of it on WhatsApp, jokingly dismissing it as just another pile of rubbish. But what happened next shocked everyone. That night, as the bonfire roared, the family recorded the flames on video. When they reviewed the footage, they noticed something strange. Take a look. A ghostly figure that looks like a horse galloping through the flames can be seen. The property had been home to horses for over 40 years, including a famous stallion known for siring one of the royal family's carriage horses. Now the family can't help but wonder, was it the spirit of this legendary horse taking one final gallop through the grounds? The video has quickly gone viral, captivating paranormal enthusiasts and equestrian lovers alike. Whether it's a trick of the light or the ghostly presence of a cherished horse, the footage has sparked countless questions about the mysterious history of the property. A mysterious encounter at a jewellery store has left employees and viewers alike unsettled. The strange incident shared on Instagram by user Paranoid Normal shows a jewellery store employee interacting with what she believed was a customer. However, the store's security footage tells a different story. Watch what happens. The employee can be seen greeting someone who appears to walk through the door. She begins showing products from the display, engaging in a conversation with what seems like a customer, but there's clearly no one there. Concerned after watching the exchange from the back room, other employees come to the front to see who she's talking to. Watch what happens. The unsettling footage has viewers convinced that the employee may have unknowingly been serving a ghost. One commenter added a spine-tingling detail suggesting that a pedestrian had been hit and killed by a passing car just outside of the store several years ago. Was this a case of a ghostly customer returning to browse or a trick of the mind? Either way, it's left everyone wondering 
who or what really walked into the store that day. Y'all going to get some doll content. For years, TikTok user Len Duran Deary has been collecting vintage dolls, but recently things have taken a bizarre turn. In a series of unsettling uploads, she claims some of her prized possessions may be haunted. What began as a simple hobby has spiralled into an eerie situation that's left her followers questioning whether the dolls are truly possessed. In one of her viral clips, the user is seen driving with one of the dolls sitting quietly in the back seat. The doll is back with us. Not the one that was stolen, but the one that we managed to wash our hands of by giving away. But as she talks to the camera, viewers notice something chilling. I had to drive 20 minutes away and come pick up this damn doll, and I never, ever, ever wanted to put this doll in my car. Ever. The only time it's ever been in my car is when I picked it up for the very first time. The doll begins to shift, blink, and move as if it were alive. She maybe passed early and was just confused on how to pass over, like cross over. So she had this little girl in my mind. I'm thinking it's a little girl. I'm saying like, we'll take care of you. We'll take care of your doll. We'll make sure nothing ever happens to the doll. La 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 la. This particular doll had been given away to family members only to be returned after strange events occurred. Don't hurt us, we'll take care of you. According to the family, their young granddaughter reported that the doll moved on its own, fell out of chairs, turned its head and looked at her, and even blinked at her. Nope. Even the girl's grandfather experienced eerie phenomena, claiming he felt an invisible force touch his shoulder. Disturbed by the occurrences, the family returned the doll, leaving the user anxious and frightened about its return. Because, and I hope the little girl's not traumatized enough where she doesn't want to play with dolls anymore. Like, that's what I hope. Like, I hope whatever's attached to this doll wasn't naughty enough that it has scarred a little girl. Like, that's what I hope. She now believes the doll may be haunted by a malevolent entity, possibly the spirit of a little girl attached to it. But we're like, it's a little girl. Like, she may be passed early and was just confused on how to pass over, like cross over. So she, she attached herself to the one thing she loves, her doll. Here's a compilation the user uploaded that shows many of the dolls moving, seemingly of their own accord. Here we see one of the cabinets that houses some of the dolls. The user says it gets unnaturally cold. And here, more strange activity can be seen caught on camera. In later clips, she shares more disturbing evidence. One video shows security footage from her home where a curtain moves mysteriously in an empty room. Alarmed, she called the police, believing someone had broken into the house. However, the officers found no intruder, leaving the user more convinced than ever that something supernatural is at play. In another strange incident, the user reveals that several of her dolls were stolen the night before a yard sale. To the thief that stole these dolls out of the yard sale at 3 o'clock this morning, you're going to regret it. They're haunted. She warns the thieves that they may have taken more than they bargained for, hinting that the dolls' haunted nature might cause them trouble. Okay, I put them in this glass hutch to try and contain whatever was attached to them, and it got so cold that it fogged up. Enjoy. Now take these backsies. With countless TikTok followers intrigued and terrified by the footage, the question remains, are these dolls truly haunted? Or is something else going on here? Regardless, the user's growing collection continues to capture the attention of those fascinated by the paranormal. Fall is for 
foliage for fun. On September 19th, 2024, an unsettling yet heartwarming piece of footage captured by user Shazalina has sparked intrigue and debate. The video, recorded during a walk in Derry Island, shows a dog named Buster seemingly interacting with an unseen presence. You right, Buster? It's left viewers questioning whether animals can sense the spirits of those who have passed on. Alright, let's go. According to Shazalina, the incident took place near her partner's family home, a place with deep emotional significance. The house had belonged to her partner's father, who had passed away almost a year earlier. With the anniversary of his death approaching, memories of his health's rapid decline had been heavy on their minds. The eerie event seemed to coincide with this emotional time. In the video, Buster suddenly leaps into the air as if trying to make contact with something that just isn't there. He appears confused, looking around as if expecting to find something physical. Right, let's go. Help me, help me. This odd behaviour, coupled with the family's emotional connection to the location, led the user to believe that Buster might have sensed the spirit of her partner's late father. Many viewers have speculated that dogs, often thought to be more attuned to the supernatural, could pick up on a presence that humans can't perceive. The timing of the event and Buster's peculiar reaction made it all the more chilling leaving the family to wonder if it was a comforting sign that their loved one was still nearby. Here's a quick and eerie one uploaded to Instagram by user Buta Decor Kahini. This flat owner has been experiencing all kinds of strange and eerie events. On this evening, she heard some noises coming from the kitchen and felt the air grow cold. She grabbed her phone and managed to capture this. Drawers are open and items are strewn about. But watch what happens next. Watching that again in slow motion, a dark figure seems to peer out from the kitchen. The clip abruptly ends and we're left wondering what it is we've just witnessed. August 19, 2024, an unusual sighting captivated residents of Contagem, Brazil. An unidentified object was observed hovering silently in the sky, remaining stationary throughout the sighting. The eerie stillness of the object raised questions and sparked widespread intrigue with many locals and online commentators jumping in to offer their theories. One commenter, J. Marcus Wiz, highlighted an interesting detail. Contagem is just four hours away from Varginha, a region notorious for one of Brazil's most well-known UFO incidents. The Varginha UFO incident of 1996 has long been a focal point for UFO enthusiasts, conspiracy theorists and paranormal investigators alike. It's often referred to as Brazil's Roswell due to its widespread media coverage and the baffling claims that emerged from the event. According to reports at the time, several residents of Varginha witnessed strange creatures in January of 1996. These creatures were described as having large red eyes, oily skin and strange bumps on their head. 
Witnesses claimed that at least one UFO had been seen in the area around the same time. Rumours began to spread that the Brazilian military had captured extraterrestrial beings and that the creatures were being kept in secret. Adding fuel to the fire, other reports included bizarre claims of animal deaths in a nearby zoo, unexplained injuries to locals, and perhaps most shockingly, the story of a woman who said she had been impregnated by one of the entities. Despite the sensational nature of these claims, an official inquiry by the Brazilian government ultimately dismissed the sightings. The investigation concluded that the witnesses had actually encountered a homeless man known as Mardinho, who was mentally unstable and had physical characteristics that could have been mistaken for something more otherworldly, especially in the state of fear and panic that had gripped the town. The military activity in the area, which many linked to the cover-up of an alien capture, was attributed to routine training exercises. Even though the official version of events pointed to more grounded explanations, the Varginha UFO incident remains a significant part of Brazil's UFO law. To this day, the story continues to captivate the imaginations of believers and skeptics alike, keeping the region's reputation as a hotspot for extraterrestrial activity alive. With Contagem being so close to Varginha, many UFO enthusiasts can't help but speculate that the two locations could be connected in some way, suggesting that this latest sighting might not be a mere coincidence. <laughs> Could Contagem be witnessing the same kind of activity that shocked Varginha nearly 30 years ago? For many, the close proximity to the original incident only heightens the intrigue surrounding this latest sighting. This is cannabis and mushrooms in a can. You ever tried? Oh like shoot! That? Let me try that. Mm, it smells good. It's nice, right? Yeah. So that's Italian lemons. Oh, I like lemons. I feel like. TikTok user Donatella336 has left viewers spooked after capturing chilling footage on her home CCTV system. The eerie events unfold in her kitchen where a series of strange occurrences are caught on camera. A knife mysteriously moves all on its own, sliding across the counter without any visible cause. Moments later, the tap turns on by itself. The unsettling activity continues. Eventually, this happens. Get it. Oh my God. Oh my God. Where is he? Many believe this to be clear evidence of poltergeist activity. But what do you think? Love to hear your thoughts on this strange home security footage in the comments down below. Up in our last segment, in just a few seconds, we take a look at some classic UFO footage that many believe shows a cloaked alien spacecraft. But you can. I always go through both. It's just easier to locate them when you, as you as you crochet. But if you want to create what's called the lip, you go in the very first stitch that's closest to you. Not both of them, just one. When you do that. At the end, it looks like there is an extra line to the stitch. I might do one row, one row like that for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Before we do, remember to hit that subscribe button. Yes, Paranormal subscribe. Research Society, or LPRS, captured some highly debated footage that still sparks controversy even today. Using a third-generation night vision camera, the group filmed a mysterious triangular object 
composed of three glowing orbs silently gliding across the night sky in Laredo, Texas. Shrouded in infrared light, invisible to the naked eye, the craft emitted no sound and cruised at an altitude of around a thousand feet, okay. traveling at approximately <laughs> 80 miles per hour. Sorry. The footage was later enhanced by videographer Jose Carlos Rodriguez, revealing what appeared to be a pyramid shaped structure hidden by an infrared cloak. Despite this compelling visual evidence, skepticism remains strong. Geoscientist and aerospace consultant Ben McGee, featured on the National Geographic series Chasing UFOs, suggested that the object was likely a Border Patrol drone. He argued that the infrared lights on drones, especially those used for anti-collision, could oversaturate a camera's infrared sensor, creating the illusion of a triangular craft. Have you ever dreamed about living in glorious harmony with nature and like-minded individuals, going off-grid and being self-sufficient, but you just can't figure out where to begin? Too many people are stuck in the rat race. Laredo, being close to the Mexican border and having a significant military presence, made it plausible that this was simply a drone used for border security. However, the LPRS firmly denied this explanation, claiming they had ruled out common aerial objects like planes, helicopters, birds and drones through side-by-side -side comparisons. For UFO enthusiasts and many viewers, the footage remains one of the most convincing cases of a cloaked alien spacecraft captured on camera. The debate over this incident has continued for over a decade. While skeptics argue for a military drone, many believe that the LPRS video shows genuine extraterrestrial activity. So what's to be believed? Love to hear your thoughts down below. Have you ever heard the eerie story of the exorcism of Kennedy Aoife? We took a deep dive on this chilling case over on our second channel, Slapped Ham Mysteries. Here's a little snippet. Throughout history, devout followers of various religions have held the belief in the existence of malevolent forces capable of escaping the depths of hell to inhabit human, animal, or even inanimate forms, wreaking havoc upon the earth. For these believers, the ritual of exorcism emerged as the singular means to rescue the souls of those afflicted by such evil influences. Conversely, individuals with more secular viewpoints came to regard claims of possession as symptomatic of severe mental or physical ailments, relegating exorcisms to the realm of fictional horror tales, such as those depicted in The Exorcist and The Conjuring film series. In a startling true crime narrative, the collision of ancient religious doctrines with modern skepticism culminated in a tragedy that some argue should be etched into history as nothing short of murder. This is The Exorcism of Kennedy Ife. If you want to hear the full story on this gruesome case, we'll put some links to the episode in the description. You're watching part two of the scariest videos of 2022. If you missed part one, there's a link in the description box below there and it's pinned in the comments. But in the meantime, sit back, relax and enjoy. Over the last few months, there have been numerous sightings of an unidentified flying object hovering over Medellin, Colombia, prompting theories that an alien craft is surveying the area. The incidents were compiled by the Instagram account BD Maestro No. 1. The most recent sighting took place on August 3, 2022, when several tourists spotted a strange craft floating near the Medellin airport. Take a look. What the f is that? Like, look, look, there's a plane. There's a plane because we have an airport here, like to the left, to the right, to the right of it. What is that? At one point, you can even see a commercial aircraft flying nearby to the mysterious object. What the f is that? Like, look, look, there's a plane. 
There's a plane because we have an airport here, like to the left, to the right, to the right. What is that? Whatever it is, it floats in stark contrast to the plane cruising below. Prior to this, on June 27, a very similar looking object was seen hovering over the city. It was also spotted on the 9th of April. Here you can see the object moving through the air rather than hovering in one spot. Then on the 10th of January, it was seen again. It was even seen as far back as December 2021. Here we can see it sitting among some dense clouds. It seems Colombia is no stranger to UFO sightings, with hundreds of reports logged over the last few decades. What makes these sightings even more mysterious and frankly quite creepy are the reports of an alien worshipping cult that went missing back in the late 1990s. Stellamaris were a doomsday cult based in Cartagena, Colombia. Founded in 1989 by Rodolfo Perez, the group prophesied an end of day scenario where mankind was doomed to suffer a cataclysmic event. According to their charismatic leader, the only way to survive the disaster was to make contact with an alien race who would select a chosen few to be taken off world. And while so far this sounds like fairly standard doomsday cult ramblings, it's what happened in June and July of 1999 that makes this event truly bizarre. Local authorities were already keeping a close eye on the cult's compound after numerous reports from concerned family members were filed, noting that they believed their loved ones had been brainwashed and that they feared for their safety. At the time, authorities were on high alert after what had happened at Jonestown in the late 70s, when close to a thousand people took their own lives. Then, in early July 1999, local police noted a lot of activity at the Stellamaris compound. It was though they were getting ready for some kind of event. As many as a hundred members were seen marching into the wilderness, including entire families. Their official statement said that they were heading to their annual retreat in the Sierra Nevada mountains, but it soon became apparent that they were actually heading to an area known for regular UFO sightings deep in the jungle. Soon after, no contact was ever made again. It's as though the entire 100 people vanished off the face of the earth. After an exhaustive search, authorities could find no trace of the group whatsoever. Their compound had been left untouched. All their belongings remained, but the entire property was eerily empty. A wider search of the area found no evidence of the group and no bodies or belongings were ever recovered. All 100 members had vanished. This spooky event prompted all kinds of theories. Many thought it was another example of Jonestown and a mass suicide had taken place, but no bodies were ever found. Others thought perhaps they were kidnapped as the wilderness where they were last spotted is known to be patrolled by dangerous militants. But no ransom was ever issued, nor was there any evidence of a kidnapping. Finally, after months of exhaustive searches with little to no evidence turning up, people began to wonder whether the cult had actually been abducted by aliens. Given their beliefs and that they had set off in search of UFOs, it's certainly strange that as many as 100 people could go missing without a trace. To this day, no one really knows what happened to the Stellamaris cult. Over the years, some fringe members have come forward saying that they never really believed in aliens. But it still doesn't account for the missing people that marched off into the jungle that day back in July of 1999. All 100 members of the Stellamaris cult are still on Colombia's missing persons list, and the case remains unsolved. It's thought that children might be more sensitive than adults to the paranormal. Maybe it's just because of their active imaginations, but kids often claim to feel and see things that grown-ups can't. This video uploaded to TikTok by Paranoid Normal shows a photograph that might just prove this to be true. The pic was snapped by a young girl on her toy camera. 
According to the girl's mother, their child had been seeing someone in her room and started refusing to sleep in there. On the day that this photo was captured, the girl and her mother were sitting inside the house all alone. As the girl was taking pictures, she turned and said, Mummy, there's a man in my photo. Her mother grabbed the camera and was startled to see the dark silhouette of a manly figure standing in their hallway. As the poster says her husband was at work at the time, who or what could this shadowy figure be? Is it possible that the young girl has captured photographic proof that there really is something else inside their home? Perhaps it's time for her parents to believe her. This next one's been doing the social media rounds this past week, prompting viewers to wonder if teleportation is a real thing. TikToker Leslie XO was happily watching the evening news when they spotted something quite unusual in the background of an interview. Take a look. <laughs> watching that again, you can see a man materialise out of nowhere. <laughs> Initially, some people thought that there must have been a cut in the footage, but if you watch the women in the foreground, there doesn't appear to be a cut at all. <laughs> then some people suggested it could be a green screen, but the news anchor and the interviewee appeared to be there in person. You can even see their hair blowing in the breeze. <laughs> The best and most enjoyable theory thrown out there is that what we're seeing is a man teleporting on live TV. Perhaps he's a time traveller on an important mission to alter our timeline. One commenter jokingly said that time travellers have to go to the grocery store just like everyone else. So what do you make of this bizarre sighting, technical glitch or genuine time traveller? Furiously type your opinions in the comments down below. <laughs> we all know parrots can talk, and there are countless videos online of them saying cute and funny things. However, did you know there are also other birds that can speak? In this clip posted to TikTok by Real Horror Talk, we see a raven sitting by the shore. Out of nowhere, it suddenly starts speaking in an incredibly deep and human-like voice. Have a listen. Here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Good boy. It seems to say, hey, come, come on. on. Good boy. <laughs> come on. Good boy. Perhaps if this was a parrot talking, one might find it amusing. However, coming from a large jet black raven, it sounds rather sinister. To make the clip even creepier, one viewer noted just how unnerving it would be if you were walking through the woods late at night and suddenly heard this. Come on. Good boy. In folklore, ravens are often associated with loss and ill omen. Yeah, they can also represent prophecy and insight. In Swedish mythology, they're thought to be the ghosts of murdered people who haven't had a Christian burial, while in German stories, they represent damned souls. Whether it's the symbolism of the bird or this one's particularly unnerving voice that makes this clip so unsettling to watch, the next time you see a raven in the wild, you probably won't look at it the same way. Here. Come on. Come on. While our previous clip wasn't as mysterious as it first appeared, this next one is a little harder to explain. It was uploaded to Instagram by Paranoid Normal. It's some security footage taken in a back alley. We can see some young kids taking some bikes. However, as one of the kids goes back for another bike in the background, something truly odd happens. Watch. A pair of shadowy legs walk to the right. The 
figure then returns and seems to reach out to the boy, who turns around to have a look. It returns once more before the clip abruptly ends. A lot of people in the comments said that this is a shadow person sighting. Many paranormal investigators believe that shadow people are a type of spiritual entity that lurk in our world. Some say they're lost souls, others have suggested they could be interdimensional beings or aliens. Regardless of what they are, tens of thousands of people all around the world have reported seeing these beings with remarkable similarity. People suffering from insomnia or sleep paralysis often describe shadowy people watching them at the corner of their eyes. So are these shadowy entities real? Judging by the reports, the thousands of testimonies and the countless videos that seem to show them, one can't help but wonder about these things when it's pitch black at 3am and you're all alone. Good thing everyone knows they can't get you when you're under a blankie. We've been following the eerie happenings of Diego Spickers for quite some time now, and it seems that his alleged haunting just gets stranger and stranger as time goes on. Diego believes that a ghostly presence has taken up residence in his apartment in Mexico. These are just the latest incidents to take place in his home. In this first clip, we can see his pet dog hiding in the corner, clearly having been spooked by something. ¿Qué pasó, niño? That's when he finds a torn apart doll on the ground. Inside of it, he finds a mysterious package. In this next clip, he finally works up the courage to open whatever it was he found inside the toy. Watch what happens. Watching that again, as he opens the piece of cloth, some fingers appear from under the table. He steps back, but there's clearly nothing there. Eerier still, inside the cloth, there appears to be a locket and some kind of dusty substance. Many viewers have speculated that they're the ashes from a cremation. In this final clip, things get even creepier. Take a look. Breaking this one down, you can hear the door handle to the bathroom violently shaking. In the glass, you can clearly make out the face of a young girl. But when he opens the door, there's nothing to be found. It's a small room with nowhere for an accomplice to hide. Some commenters said that the cloth in the second clip looks like a hex bag. These are sometimes used by practitioners of black magic to form a curse on a specific place or person. So are we witnessing the fallout of a dark curse? For now, we'll have to wait and see as more haunting videos are captured in the home of Diego Speakers. Our last segment of the day comes from a TikToker who's been documenting some very strange activity inside of his apartment. Several of the clips have gone viral, prompting an ever-growing audience of followers to speculate on what's really going on. It all began when user Domatagian uploaded a short clip showing some very unusual banging inside of his home. Take a look. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to Listen to it. He opens the door. 
There's this, nothing there. I mean, this is my whole closet right here. This is my kitchen. The OP says that the building was built back in 1932, and while he's normally a fairly level-headed sort of person, the continued activity has led him to speculate that the property might be haunted. He is the same noise again, but during the day. In the afternoon, just to prove that there's nothing there. Jesus. This time he opens the front door to prove that there's no one outside of the apartment banging. Just to prove. He then opens the closet and, as before, yeah. there's no one there. Jesus Christ. Following these clips going viral, Domatagian started gaining followers who were keen on getting involved with the mystery. Before long, they started asking questions. Nobody's ever been hurt. It's usually just the banging on the door. Do I 100% believe that it is something paranormal? Well, not 100%, but I'd like to try and disprove that it is something like a ghost first. And while he's not ruling out something paranormal, he says he's quite sceptical and that he just wants to solve the mystery. Spurred on by his followers, the OP ran a live stream where he tried communicating with any alleged spirits that might be present. All right, let's try and get it on camera this time. Uh, can you explain psychic? Can you tell me what psychic means? Catherine. You're a Catherine that's a psychic? If so... And when trying to communicate further, this happens. Catherine, would you like to tell us why... Stop recording. The app tells him to stop recording, and judging by the look in his eyes, he's quite terrified by the response. This is an ongoing saga over on TikTok, and there's a lot more we weren't able to cover here, so I highly recommend you head over and watch the events play out. As always, I'll put a link in the description box down below. In the afternoon, just to prove that there's nothing there. Jesus Christ. This creepy encounter was uploaded to Instagram by the South American news outlet Infobay. This bus driver from the Salta province of Argentina says he was finishing his shift driving an empty bus back to the depot when suddenly the stop button was pressed as though a passenger wanted to get off. He took out his phone to film what was happening. The driver shows us how strange it is that the stoplight had been activated, despite the fact that there's no passengers on board the bus. Now things get even creepier when you listen closely to the footage. In it, you can hear a woman's voice. Translated from Spanish, it sounds like the voice says, stop, driver. The bus driver was stumped by the incident and has no way of explaining what happened. There's been no official word from the bus company either, so for now, this very eerie encounter will have to remain a complete mystery. Many of us had imaginary friends as children. It seems that it's all part of growing up. But what if these friends were not so imaginary after all? Take a look at this photo uploaded to Facebook by user Laredo Paranormal Stories. In it, we can see that there appears to be a second figure next to the boy in the blue shirt. The figure's face looks pale, even skeletal. Its hair appears dishevelled and wild, and its body almost seems to be a black void. The photo was captured by the poster's husband. The poster believes that it shows their son playing with his imaginary friend, Pauline. It seems that the picture freaked the family out so much that shortly after it was taken, they decided to move home. Despite the figure's creepy appearance, several viewers thought that it didn't look as though it posed a threat to the boy. In fact, one viewer even suggested that it could have been the boy's guardian angel. 
So what do you think this photo shows? Is it really the child's imaginary friend? If it is, then one has to wonder whether or not she followed the family to their new house. This next video was uploaded to TikTok by user Monique Hernandez. The clip is taken from a home security camera positioned at the front of the TikToker's house. They asked their viewers for an explanation, posing the question, is this a ghost caught on my ring camera? Take a look at what's been captured. The caption reads, why can you see the truck through him? Which is a valid question. If we watch it again, zoomed in and slowed down, you can indeed see details of the truck as the figure walks by. Howard. Jennifer says that it's a single frame captured by a home security system after it detected movement in the living room. Here you can see the living room with Jennifer sound asleep on her bed. She says that they had moved her bed into the living room because they were renovating and had recently painted the walls of the bedroom. Eerily, just next to the bed is a strange looking figure. It's partially blurred. It seems to be leering over the bed. Jennifer notes that you can see her two dogs asleep on the bed. They're normally very sensitive and will bark at the slightest movement, yet here they're sound asleep. Creepier still, for some reason, the security camera only captured a single frame and didn't go on to record a video. So all that was captured was this eerie figure standing by the bed for a split second, then nothing. So who or what is this figure by the bed? Jennifer says she was the only one home at the time and is at a loss to explain the sighting. If it was a burglar, you'd think the camera would have caught more footage and the dog certainly would have started barking. So for now, this eerie sighting will have to remain a mystery. Some spooky security footage captured at a discount supermarket in the United States has left viewers asking the question, are ghosts real? In mid-September 2022, CCTV footage at a Dollar General store in Humansville, Missouri captured a strange apparition in one of the offices. The footage was uploaded to YouTube by the Humansville Paranormal Society. Take a look. This one's finished. Nine rolls across, five feet down. At around 2am, the mist-like shape moves from left to right in the back office of the store. It appears, then disappears, leaving no trace whatsoever. 